Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. I enjoy going to church. Amen. As a kid, it sometimes became a drudgery because I lived at church. <laughs> I, I was born and raised in church. A few days after I was born, I was on the front pew there of Natchez Church and I never left. I got old enough to go over to the men's side of the church because the old country churches, they had women and men's sides as far as the altars. And my the pastor wife sat on the front pew is custom, and that's where I was raised, right there in the front pew. And I've told you many times the games we used to play under the pews, our favorite game was the bobby pin game. And the ladies all got on one side of the church at the altar call, and they'd shout the hair down and they had lots of bobby pins and other things in their hair to pile it high. And if you got an oatmeal can, you won the game. Automatic winner there. Amen. And so the big bobby pins were worth five points. The little ones were worth one. And so we risked life and limb many times to dive in there and get that big bobby pin or oatmeal can and Hallelujah, because winning it at all costs. And I got knocked out one time. Sister Judy Stone kicked me right in the temple. Just put her back of her heel, hit the temple, knocked me out cold. Thank God I had a twin brother that had mercy on my poor lifeless body and drug me back underneath the pew and slapped me until I came to. Amen. So but we, we made it. Amen. So church has always been a fun place, great place to come, and then growing up in church literally was fun. We used to play tennis on the roof of the church, and we had all kind of fun events in the house of God, around the house of God. So it was my privilege tonight to bring to you the word of the Lord, and this message was born in the prayer room where a lot of times God talks to me, but this message came um, courtesy of Sister Lefwich. She was in there praying one morning. She had got there before I did. And uh, I walked into the prayer room, and she was sitting in the chair that I normally sit in. And I just went over to my other chair and, and sat down. As I sat down, she, she had stopped praying, and she said, Brother Nathan, do you want your prayer chair? <laughs> and uh, God started dealing with me about my prayer chair. And that message is I entitled this message from the Lord to you, my prayer place, my prayer chair. Hallelujah. It's the place where I have touched God. I don't know how long we've been doing the morning prayers, but ever since Brother Sarton started it, I jumped at the chance to be a part of that. And at 6 o'clock every morning, Monday through Friday, I come and I pray in that chair. So uh, if you added all the time I spent in that single chair, I sit in the same spot every morning unless somebody's in my spot. And that has never happened except that one time. I, I guess I spent a couple of days in that chair praying and talking to God and having him talk to me. And I want to talk to you about that sacred place that you need to have in your life and teach upon the prayer place or your prayer chair or wherever position of prayer that you have to be a daily relationship with God. You have to have a prayer place. You may be seated. I'll read several scriptures tonight. The first scripture I'll read is Matthew 26 and 36. It tells us, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place. There was a place that Jesus knew well called Gethsemane. And he saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. There, <clears throat> there was no directions needed. He didn't have to ask where this prayer spot was. He didn't have to stop and ask, hey, y'all know where Gethsemane at? Uh, I, I think that's where I want to go pray. He didn't have to Google places to pray. He had already predetermined, hey, when I need a prayer spot and I'm in Jerusalem, that's... Uh, that's where I can go. I can walk to this place. I can get to my prayer place. He had chose in advance a place to pray. We must follow Christ's example and find a place to pray. 
Mark 1 and 35 again tells us, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Your prayer place needs to be a solitary place, a place of a dead end, alone, that you can touch God without distraction. Hallelujah. Mark knew this. He observed Jesus getting up early in the morning, but way before daylight, the Bible says, and pray. Hallelujah. I know our neighbors are wondering why Sister Rome, hallelujah, and her good friend Sister McDowell get up several days a week, and they're in their prayer room from 2 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the morning praying. Why are these elders praying for two hours in the middle of the night? Hallelujah. They want apostolic revival on this West Bank. They want to tear down the gates of hell every day. They want to see people that are backslide come back to the house of God. They want miracle signs and wonders in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Why are we having such great worship on Wednesday night? The last couple of weeks especially have been great. Hallelujah. It's because prayer is being made. Hallelujah. I challenge you if you're retired or you can work that into your schedule, these ladies can pray. Hallelujah. It'll be a great place to learn to pray. It'll be great to join with them from two to four and pray and call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to have a great time in the prayer room and when you join them from two to four. I challenge you to do that. Hallelujah. Maybe that'll be your place of prayer. Hallelujah. You need a prayer place in your life. Four great and awesome benefits that I thought of. Hallelujah. Of a predetermined prayer place. If you have predetermined, I am going to pray at this place at this time. There's some great benefits for determining that in advance. Hallelujah. I exercise when I have an opportunity to exercise, but I do not have a dedicated place of exercise. Hallelujah. I do not belong to a gym. I do not have a gym set up at my house. Therefore, my fitness isn't as great as those who have determined to be in a gym or in a place of exercise at a certain time. Hallelujah. And prayer is just like exercise. When you determine a place to do it, it will cause you to do it more often. Benefit number one. And another benefit I never realized, by having the same place of prayer that you go to every day, you receive an extra benefit by doing that. You have the stimulus of prayer effect in your life. What do you mean by that? I mean every sight, every sound, every smell. Hallelujah. I can sit anywhere I want to in that prayer room, but I have chose to sit in that chair, and that chair feels like prayer to me. If I was blindfolded and sat down anywhere in this church in any chair or situation where I could sit, Hallelujah, I could tell the difference between that prayer chair and any other chair in this church. Hallelujah, because I have spent hours, days, hallelujah, sitting in that chair, praying and calling upon God and hearing the voice of God. I challenge you to get a prayer place that you know so well that even if you were blindfolded and you were sitting down in your prayer chair or wherever you do your prayer, you would know that was the place that you were at. Hallelujah. And therefore, if you have a prayer place, you get the stimulus of all your senses. Hallelujah. You know it says prayer. Hallelujah. The smell, the, 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 the clicks of the fan in the prayer rooms. Hallelujah. It all just screams prayer to me because that's what I've done every morning. And I've developed that prayer place. Hallelujah, a prayer place can be sanctified. Hallelujah, man, the, all, the prayer room is definitely sanctified. It's a place that's dedicated solely to God. You need to make sure your prayer place is solely dedicated to God. 
Hallelujah. I don't know if you saw the movie War Room, but that dear old black lady, hallelujah, had developed a room in her house that she went to, and she went to war against the forces that were trying to destroy her family. Hallelujah. And you saw her rejoicing in the kitchen as she came out of her prayer place. Hallelujah. Because she had known God there, and she was assured that victory was going to be taking place in her family. Hallelujah. You can tear down the gates of hell in the prayer place. Hallelujah. Because it's a place that causes you to be more consistent in prayer. Hallelujah. If you don't have a daily prayer life, you don't have a prayer place. Because a prayer place will cause you to pray daily. Hallelujah. Some days I don't go to sleep as early and as quick as I normally would. But when that alarm goes off at 5 o'clock, I jump out of bed. Why? Well, I got to get to my prayer place by 6 o'clock. Hallelujah. It just grabs me. It pulls me out of bed. No matter how tired I am, no matter what I got to do that day, I can think of nothing but my prayer place. Hallelujah. It draws you to do it. Hallelujah. You have to have a prayer place to be successful and be dynamic in God. And you need to listen to the bishop's message on significant prayers because you just don't want to show up and go through the motions. You want to show up and be effective in your prayers. Hallelujah. It's a great message on what to do when you get to your prayer place. Hallelujah. I had a great and awesome mom and dad that showed me that prayer places were important. They did it consistently. As a kid growing up, I did not notice how consistent they were and how awesome their prayer life was. I did not realize they daily talked to the Lord. But one day as the boys, we had all chores. My mama had legal, yellow legal pad sheets, magnets on the side of the refrigerator. And every week the chores got you know, rearranged and we got different chores. And um, some chores stayed the same, but some would change. And this week, hallelujah, I remember it was my turn to vacuum. And the entire house back then was carpet, so vacuuming was a big chore. Hallelujah. We had a two-story house. Everything but the bathrooms and the kitchen had carpet in it. And most of it was that shag carpet. It looked like it needed to be mowed. Hallelujah. And we had that nice vacuum cleaner, the Electrolux, with the bag in it. And you had to drag that thing all over the house, and it was heavy and Boy, but I was vacuuming. I was trying to get it done in a hurry because I had some outside activities I wanted to go be a part of. And I went to go vacuum my mom and dad's room. That was the last room of the house I had to vacuum. So I went in there and was vacuuming. And I went over to my dad's side of the bed and was vacuuming. I noticed there were some dents in the carpet. And I vacuumed them and nothing happened. And I vacuumed again and nothing happened. And then I realized, hey, those dents are in the carpet because my dad knelt beside that bed every single day of his life and would pray for extended periods of time, so much so that he had left indentions in the carpet that would not even be fixed with a vacuum cleaner. Hallelujah. And then I realized, hey, prayer is important. A prayer place is something you have to have. Hallelujah. It caused great revival in Natchez. He was able to double the church in his short time of pastorate there. Hallelujah, because prayer was a part of his daily life. Hallelujah. The last project we worked on him, with him on together, he always had projects for his boys to help him with. Hallelujah, just to spend time with us and to let us know we were important as the church and the work of God. And the last project that we had together was cutting a two-mile trail through the Natchez Trace Parkway, hallelujah, that was adjacent to our land. Hallelujah, we cut a two-mile trail. We thought it was a three-wheeler trail for our three-wheeler. Hallelujah, but it really was a prayer trail. Hallelujah, he'd walked that two-mile trail, hallelujah, as many times as he could. Hallelujah, and pray the entire time. And he would just pray, and he would call upon God. And he could know just the whole time he was walking, he was praying out loud with fervent prayer. Hallelujah. That was one of his second favorite place to pray. And this third favorite place to pray, and he did this often when there was a big decision to be made at the church. He would get on the floor behind the pulpit, and he would bury his head in his coat. 
Hallelujah. And he would pray until God gave him the answer the body of Christ needed. Hallelujah. We saw him many times praying with moanings and groanings there on the floor behind the pulpit. And then a big decision would come up after that would happen. And he would have the mind of God for the church there in Natchez. Because he had a prayer place. He heard from God. Hallelujah. There was no false steps. There was no directions that had to be corrected. When you have a prayer place, God keeps you in tune with the will of God. You wondering what the will of God is in your life? Get a prayer place and you'll know what thus saith the word of the Lord. Though he speaks through you in visions, dreams, or just a still small voice. Hallelujah. Your prayer place is where you'll hear from God. Hallelujah. you got to have a prayer place. I want this coming year to be an apostolic revival. I want it to be better and bigger and more awesome than it's ever been in the last 25 years that I've been a part of this church. I want it to be the greatest it's ever been. Hallelujah. And that will happen as we develop prayer places and call upon God every single day of our lives. Hallelujah. You say, Brother Nathan, I have an unsaved spouse. Praying just any time, anywhere is not possible for me. Well, I got you the answer. Granny Triplett had an unsaved spouse. Hallelujah. So her prayer place was once my granddaddy went to bed, he began to snore. Hallelujah. And that was her cue to get out of bed and go to her prayer place. Hallelujah. I thought she was spiritual, but my wife probably would agree (laughs) that I snore. She probably did it just to get some peace. (laughs) Amen. I don't know. But she would go to her prayer place in the hallway, and she would wrap a blanket around her head, and she would pray silently for hours because he was a light sleeper. She didn't want to wake him. And so she prayed without making a sound for hours. She would weep and intercede for things, hallelujah, for hours. At 4 o'clock, she would get up and cook breakfast, making biscuits and everything else you would associate with breakfast. She did that every day of her life, Monday through Friday, for 30-something years that he worked at the Ingalls shipyard as a welder. Hallelujah, that's what she did. She prayed all the time in that hallway. Hallelujah. You have things in your life you don't want. Uh, Hallelujah. She grew up in a kid in an abusive home. Hallelujah. Because alcohol made one of her parents, hallelujah, very mean. They were just a mean drunk. Uh, So when she got married, uh, she realized, hey, this guy that just got out of World War II was doing what he, he was doing in the war, was drinking and smoking and and acting like, you know, the World War II soldier he was. And she said, hey, I can't put up with that. I'm going to pray that out of the house. Uh, Hallelujah. Two cases of beer were in the refrigerator that night, and she prayed all night against that beer in the fridge. And God said, speak the word, and I will honor it. And she said, God, every time he drinks a beer, let him throw up. Hallelujah. The next day, he started throwing up every time he drank a beer. After about two or three beers, hallelujah, he quit, and he never drank a beer for the next 50 years. Hallelujah. Why? Granny prayed in her place of prayer. She got the beer out of the fridge. Hallelujah. She was afraid that TV in the living room would corrupt her kids because she didn't have any control over that. And so she prayed, uh, and he went to Sears and Roebuck and bought the biggest TV they had. Hallelujah. Brought it home, was so proud of his TV, but he didn't know Granny prayed. Uh, And she went to her prayer place, and she said, God caused that thing to break. It broke the next day. Hallelujah. He went to Sears and got a newer, bigger one. It broke. Hallelujah. Granddaddy wasn't dumb. He realized what he was a hold of. He remembered the beer. Hallelujah. He just got rid of the TV. Amen. He wouldn't waste his money anymore at Sears except on tools. Amen. Why, Granny went to her prayer place. She got rid of the things she was afraid of that would hurt her kids. Her kids grew up in a home without a TV, without beer, without alcohol. Hallelujah, because she had a prayer place. Hallelujah, what do you want out of your home? What do you want out of your family? Go to your prayer place and get rid of it. You can make a difference in their lives. God will help you as he helped Granny get rid of the things that she 
feared in her home. My mom's prayer place was in the living room, kneeling before the recliner. Hallelujah. She'd spread the Bible out on the recliner, and she would read and pray. And she would be so lost in the Spirit so many times when we came home from school, she didn't even know we were in the house. And that's pretty lost in the Spirit when you have three boys come running through the house, screaming and hollering and whatever boys do when they get home from school. We were not quite at all, but she didn't even know we were there. Why? She was caught up into a heaven beyond that prayer room that she had created, that prayer place uh, in front of that recliner. As soon as you came through the door, there was a living room, and there would be mama interceding for you and praying for you. Didn't make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Uh, Hallelujah. Have you ever caused your kids to have those Chill bumps from you praying. Hallelujah. I know what that is like. Uh, Walk in and have your mama interceding for you. Hallelujah. And she did that the entire time we lived in that house. That was her prayer place. Oh, do you have a prayer place? I'm encouraging you. You have to get one. You have to create one. You have to find one. If you had one and you're not visiting it very often, dust it off. Hallelujah. Recreate it. Do something. Find a new one. Hallelujah. You got to have that prayer place. Hallelujah. Go back to it. I challenge you in the morning or whenever you pray to get to that prayer place once again and establish that consistent daily prayer. Amen, because it will make a difference. Daniel 6 and 10 tells us about Daniel's prayer place. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into the house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. It wasn't the first time he prayed because if you wait till you're in trouble to pray, you end up begging because you don't have a relationship with God Almighty. Your faith will be weak and you will beg instead of pray, instead of touch God and be have great faith uh, that you can stand upon the word of God that you hear and speak the word into existence that you need. Uh, hallelujah. It happens because you have a prayer place uh, that you're continually visiting. Hallelujah. The king had been tricked. Uh, hallelujah. And this is found in verses 4 and 7 and throughout this chapter. The presence and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion or no, no fault. They were trying to find a, a weakness in Daniel. Hallelujah. They were trying to find something he was doing wrong where they could write him out. But as far as much he was faithful. Hallelujah. A prayer place will make you faithful. It'll make you a better employee. Hallelujah. It'll make you a better owner of your business if you have a prayer place. And that's what it did for Daniel. They couldn't find a mistake in anything he did. There was no error or fault found in him, verse 4 tells us. Oh, you become spiritually fit in a prayer place. Verse 7 says, In all the presence of the kingdom, governors and princes, counselors, captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statue. And to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, say thee, O king, shall be cast into a den of lions. They had been sneaky. They tricked the king. Hallelujah. But Daniel's prayer place wasn't for sale. Hallelujah. He wasn't on quit praying just because there was a threat against prayer. Hallelujah. He went back to his prayer place three times a day. It was known by his co-workers. Hallelujah. If you have a prayer place, your neighbors, your friends, your family, hallelujah, the people around you know that you have a prayer place. Hallelujah. You just establish it and you keep going to it. And eventually the people around you will take notice. It will be a, a witness to them of your relationship with Christ, how important it is. How no, how does it help you? What does it make you different? Oh, a prayer place will make you different than the people of this world. Amen. I can remember my first 
Well, my second job was at Walmart, and I had just got hired right before the Christmas holidays, Thanksgiving holidays, and my first couple of days, they showed me around, and then they gave me the job nobody wanted that was sitting outside by the Christmas trees and selling Christmas trees. When somebody came out to the lot and get you know, to buy one, you'd help them load it up and stuff like that. So I was sitting out there bored out of my mind because it was early, th- early November Thanksgiving area and people had, wasn't buying trees. Most people didn't start buying trees to after Thanksgiving. So I was just bored still. So I finally went to my manager and said, would you mind if I read a book while I'm sitting out there doing nothing? Hallelujah. Because you just basically got me out here guarding these trees where nobody can come in and steal one. He said, sure, Nathan, that's fine. Read, read, read a book, but just be attentive when somebody shows up. I said, I will. So I started bringing my Bible to work, and I would read uh, my Bible for hours while I watched these Christmas trees and occasionally help somebody. And people would come up to me later on, weeks later, said, you're the only Christian I've ever seen read a Bible. And I was like, wow. I said, thank God I had a prayer place that caused me to have the boldness and the thought given to me by God to read that Bible and be a mighty witness to many people that came to church with me while I was working there. Why? Because a prayer place changed my actions. Oh, if you have a prayer place, you're going to act different. You're going to think different. You're going to do things you wouldn't do otherwise without that prayer place. I challenge you to get your prayer place going if you don't already have one. Hallelujah. Luke 10, 11 and 1 tells us another scripture about prayer places concerning the Lord. And it came to pass that while he was praying in a certain place, When he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Hallelujah. God, uh, Christ, God in the flesh, had a prayer place. Hallelujah. How much more do you need a prayer place? Uh, Hallelujah. And there the disciples who were becoming apostles learned to pray in a prayer place. Hallelujah. The greatest place to learn to pray is is in a prayer place with other people who know how to pray. Hallelujah. That's why I would encourage you to come to the prayer room when you have a prayer warrior. Hallelujah. Praying. Hallelujah. You want to hear your bishop pray? Come at 6 o'clock in the morning. Hallelujah. And hear him pray. You can learn how to pray from this great man of God. And it's a great place to be. Hallelujah. To learn to pray. Oh, go to a prayer place of someone that you know that knows how to pray. Hallelujah. Prayer places can be places where you pray alone or they can be with groups. Hallelujah. But most of all, you go to a prayer place where an elder knows how to pray, someone that knows how to touch God, has, knows how to pray significant prayers. Someone that when they pray, things happen. That's where you need to go to learn to pray. If you don't know how to pray, find that prayer place with someone. Hallelujah. And let that be where you pray. And hallelujah. Your prayer place needs to be like Matthew 6 says, and 6 and 6. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, you need to shut the door. Get rid of all the distractions. You can't have phones ringing. You can't have all that distraction of technology. Hallelujah. When I pray in the prayer room, hallelujah, I make sure my phone is turned off because my watch is broke. I have to bring my phone in to make sure I don't not late for work. But it's just the time is all I can see. It doesn't get turned on at all. Why? Because I know I got to pray. I got to touch God. Hallelujah. In a place that is free of everything. Hallelujah. That's what you want in your prayer place. You want it distraction free. Hallelujah. You go to your prayer place and and you have a distraction, the devil will activate that distraction immediately. Hallelujah. Why? Because you're fixing to touch God, and he don't want that to happen. Hallelujah. You want to go to a place you can get alone with God. Amen. Another thing is prayer meetings. Hallelujah. We have a quarterly prayer and fasting. That's my favorite time of the year 
because the prayer meetings that occur each and every night. Hallelujah. It is so fantastic. This church does a great job. I've never seen another church do it like that. Hallelujah. And that's why the work of God here is prosperous. Why? This church knows how to pray. Hallelujah. We just got to do what we know what to do, saints of God. Brother and sister, you know how to pray. Many of you do. Hallelujah. Many of you have had a prayer place or currently have a prayer place. Hallelujah. Make sure you go to these prayer meetings when we have them. Hallelujah. Every night, I don't want to miss a night because that prayer meeting is awesome. Great and awesome things happen at prayer meetings. Hallelujah. I can remember many things that God has done for me at a prayer meeting. Hallelujah. I remember when we had cell groups. We had prayer night one night at Sister Margaret Amon's house. I can take you to the house right there on Mount Rushmore. Hallelujah. That where she lived. I believe that was the street. Is not it? Mount LeBlanc. Hallelujah. I know her house. I can take you to the house. And where we had that prayer meeting that night, I had hurt myself at work. My back was killing me. I was in extreme pain. I never felt that much pain in my life. I could barely move. Hallelujah. People would had to help me get up out of a chair. I couldn't even get out of a chair on my own. Hallelujah. And I went to that prayer meeting. God, I want to be touched. I'm too young to have back surgery. I don't want to have a back surgery at 30 years old, I think I was at that time. Hallelujah. And I went there desiring a miracle. As we began to pray, I felt the warm oil of the healing virtue of Christ land on my head. And I felt it dripping down my face. And when it got to my back, the pain went away. And my back has been made whole for 20-something years now. Hallelujah. Why? Because I was at a prayer meeting. <laughs> Hallelujah. God did that divine miracle in my back at our prayer meeting. And uh, Acts 16, 13, and 14 tells us about our prayer meeting. On the Sabbath, we left the city and went down along the river. We have a river right here in the great Mississippi River where we had heard there was to be a prayer meeting. Oh, what a wonderful place to pray is by a river. Hallelujah. And they had an awesome prayer meeting. And great and mighty things happened in that prayer meeting. One Lydia, a seller of textiles, became a mighty force in the kingdom of God from that prayer meeting. Hallelujah. And do you have an opportunity to go to a prayer meeting? That's a great place to pray. Hallelujah. And you bind together when we do these prayer and fasting sessions. Be here every night because you get to bind together with the body of Christ. Hallelujah. There's going to be miracles that occur in those prayer meetings. It just that's all, it came nothing else but happened but signs, wonder, and miracles when the body of Christ comes in one accord in one place and begins to pray. Hallelujah. Awesome things happen in our prayer places, whether it's single or with a group. Amen. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, we read about the prayer room in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Jesus had just been caught up into the heavens, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were coming, they went into an upper room. Hallelujah. Peter, Philip, all the apostles were there. Hallelujah. Even the mother of Jesus was in this prayer meeting, and they prayed for days and days. Hallelujah, they, they prayed, and when, when they were sitting there in prayer, hallelujah, all of a sudden, a rushing mighty wind filled the house. Hallelujah, and they all began to speak with other tongues. The day of Pentecost happened because of a prayer meeting. Amen. Great things happen at prayer meetings. Peter prayed at lunchtime. Oh, that's a good time to pray if you're working when you're on your break at lunch. Find a place to pray. Find a corner in that building or somewhere where you can go and pray for a few minutes. It'll make a difference in your day. Hallelujah. I used to go into the tool shack when I was in the oil field. It seemed to be the place nobody was. Hallelujah. At lunchtime. 
Hallelujah. I'd eat my lunch quickly and go over to that tool shack where all the power tools were kept. Hallelujah. And I could walk up and down those aisles in that tool shack and pray and call upon the Lord. Hallelujah. And seek peace in my soul and protection and things that I needed. Oh, in my prayer place, I found that even at work, I would make a place for prayer at lunchtime. And that's what Peter was doing. He was praying on his lunch break. And it says on verse 9, on the moor, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which was lunchtime. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready... The food wouldn't come in together as quick as it normally did. He fell into a trance. Hallelujah. And there we have Acts chapter 10 because Peter was praying. Hallelujah. Without a prayer place, Acts 10 wouldn't have happened. Cornelius would have had to wait for somebody else to hear the voice of God, for somebody else to get the trance, the dream, or the vision. Hallelujah. God has a prayer place for you. He has a word for you. He wants to deliver his will for you. He wants to help you save someone that will turn the world upside down. Why? That's going to happen in your prayer place. You're going to miss that opportunity to witness because you didn't pray, but you have a prayer place you're not going to miss it. You're going to take that soul and you're going to save them and then they're going to turn their family and their world upside down for God. Hallelujah. Because Peter had a prayer place. Hallelujah. He heard the voice of God. He had that vision. And in Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 5, we found that somebody else was having a prayer place. It's funny. Throughout the scripture, you can see prayer being connected to another prayer. Hallelujah. And when somebody else has a prayer place and you have a prayer place, God can link you up and let the will of God and many miracles happen. And there was a, centi- a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He had a place of prayer. He went to it every day, not just when he needed something, not just when he was in trouble or when he was fixing to go to battle as a soldier, but he prayed to God on a regular basis. And he saw a vision of evidently about the ninth hour that afternoon around three o'clock of the day of an angel coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked up upon him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up before me a memorial before God. Hallelujah. I looked up the definition of memorial. It said a structure built to remind others of something. Hallelujah. How big of a structure has your prayers built before the Lord for your lost loved ones, for that need in your life? Hallelujah. Are you building on that structure every day? Hallelujah. That's what Cornelius did. He built on the structure. Hallelujah. Every day he added something to that structure, to that memorial before God. And eventually God said, hey, this memorial's got too big. We need to move this memorial, this structure, hallelujah, into that warehouse of answered prayers. Hallelujah. And that's when God came down and answered his prayer where he could get that memorial moved over there to that warehouse of answered prayers is what I believe happened. Hallelujah, because now he has a word from the Lord. Peter has a word from the Lord. An apostolic breaks out in his, re- in his house. His whole house receives the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he had a prayer place. Hallelujah. A prayer place can save your family no matter where they are, no matter what's going on in their life. A prayer place can change their eternal destiny. Why? Because you're adding to that structure every day. You're calling their name in prayer every day in your prayer place. Hallelujah. And eventually God is going to answer that prayer. Why? Because you keep going back to that prayer place and you keep adding to your structure of prayer. Hallelujah. And that's the way we want to do it. But you know what? If you don't choose a prayer place, God will choose a prayer place for you. 
Hallelujah. Jonah is a great example in the Word of God. He didn't pray until God put him in a fish's belly. And the Bible says he cried out unto the Lord. He prayed then. Hallelujah. But that's not the place I want to go every day to pray. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have to get swallowed by a whale, Brother Jeff, to pray. If you're swallowed up in problems, financial, relationship, whatever the issues are, you may want to check and see where your prayer place has vanished to. Create one if you don't have one. Why? You may be in the belly of the fish. Hallelujah. God may have sent a well by and swallowed up everything that you thought you had. Hallelujah. You thought you had it together, but all of a sudden you're in distress. You're in sickness. You're in danger. You're in pain. Why? Because God's trying to cause you to go to a prayer place. Hallelujah. I encourage you to choose to develop a relationship with God through a prayer place out of love and desire to be closer to God. That prayer place is going to be awesome. Hallelujah. That fish's belly prayer places that God creates to get you to pray isn't where you want to be. Hallelujah. Three P's of your prayer stool. Remember our prayer partner, a period of time that you have selected to go to every day at that same time in a prayer place. Hallelujah. I pray sitting down in that chair. Hallelujah. I told you my granny laid on the ground. She never prayed except laying on the carpet, buried her head in that blanket. Hallelujah. Why? Because that's what she had to do for that unsaved husband. That was her prayer place. God doesn't really care where your prayer place is. He just wants you to show up every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's like, you no know, Sister Ron cooks a great meal every day. That's all I'm looking for is the great meal. I'm not trying to tell her how to cook or where to cook. I just want to show up at the table every day for that great meal. Hallelujah. God wants you to show up every day. He's looking forward to it. He desires your relationship. He desires you to have a prayer place because he knows with a prayer place you will be consistent in your prayers. Hallelujah. Judges 16, 27 through 30 tells us this of a man, a man of God that lost his prayer place. Hallelujah. And eventually had a sad ending to his life. And that is Samson. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there upon the roof were 3,000. Just the upper deck held 3,000. It was a great big place that beheld Samson. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. And strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. They had blinded him because he didn't have a prayer place. He started flirting with the world. That's how you know you don't have a prayer place. You'll flirt with the world. You'll do things off color. You'll tell a joke that really you wouldn't told if you'd been praying in your prayer place. You do go places you wouldn't go because you hadn't been in your prayer place. You know if you're honest with yourself, hallelujah, when you're praying, you have a certain things that you do, and then when you're not praying, you don't have that prayer place. Man, things start to wobble. You start watching things a little off color. Hallelujah. The language can get a little worse, and it won't bother you. Why? Because you don't have a prayer place. Hallelujah. And that's what happened to Samson. He got caught up in the lust of his life in Delilah, and it took his eyes out. The world always treats you bad. Hallelujah. Go to your prayer place where you can be treated lovingly by your heavenly Father. He will take care of you. He will provide for you. Hallelujah. He will direct you in your prayer place. And Samson took hold of those two middle pillars upon which the house stood, upon which it was bore up, and one on his right hand and the other on his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon all those in the house. And those that died in that, that one act were greater than all the victories added together. All the people that he had killed, hallelujah, all those Philistines he had destroyed, he killed more in that day, hallelujah, when that one act. But I just want to think, what could Samson have done with a prayer place? 
He could have lived for a long time with a prayer place. He could have had many great victories with a prayer place. He could have made a bigger difference with a prayer place. Hallelujah. Let's stand right now. Hallelujah. In just a moment of prayer. Hallelujah. You've heard the word of the Lord. The scripture is very clear. We need a prayer place. The examples personally and throughout the word of God. Hallelujah. Make it crystal clear. Hallelujah. A prayer place will make a difference in your life. But it will also make a difference in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Apostolic revival will come upon the West Bank quicker and greater measure when when we all have a prayer place uh, we will be stronger as a body of Christ uh, we will have the gifts of the spirit operating why because we're all in a prayer place God can trust us uh, with these gifts of uh, power and grand uh, why because we have a prayer place uh, you won't be lifted up in pride just because God uses you to have a miracle or to raise the dead or to heal the sick uh, why because you're in a prayer place uh, in that prayer place you're crucifying the flesh daily. Hallelujah. Commit to your prayer place. If the storm threw you off your prayer place, come back to it tomorrow. Hallelujah. If life has thrown you a curve, come back to your prayer place. The holidays oftentimes throw me off of my prayer place. I have to make an effort and say, hey, I can't let the holidays knock me off my prayer place. I still got to go. When I'm off work, I still got to go. Hallelujah, my prayer place is important. Hallelujah, I can't take a day off. Hallelujah, call out to God right now. God, I will recommit to my prayer place. I will be faithful to my prayer place. I won't let life, I won't let circumstance determine if I go to prayer tomorrow. I'm going to prayer regardless. My place of prayer, I will be in my prayer chair at 6 a.m. tomorrow, God. No matter what, hallelujah, that's what you need to promise God right now. Make a commitment to him. I will be in my prayer place tomorrow or tonight, whenever you pray and wherever you pray at. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, the word of the Lord is good. But it's only beneficial if we use it and do it. Hallelujah. As the pastor comes at this time, one last time, get your prayer place going. Amen. Come on, wasn't that powerful?